I'm really excited to introduce my colleague, Jim Scott, who is a graduate of the Moorestown Friends School in New Jersey, <laughs> as well as other fine schools. Um, he's the author of several important books, some of which you have probably heard of. I'd call the books classics, but unlike classics, some people actually enjoy reading Jim's books. Um, he's a Sterling Professor of Political Science here at Yale, but we in anthropology really appreciate it when he calls himself an honorary anthropologist. And we in the South, Southeast Asian Studies Council really need to thank Jim for the mountains of merit that he has accrued on our behalf over the years. In Burma, like other parts of Theravada Southeast Asia, merit making entails the act of giving, cultivating virtue and mental development. And I think it suffices to say that Jim does all of those things. He's a man of many good deeds and much merit, and it's a real pleasure to introduce him today for his talk on Irrawaddy. So Jim, take it away. Thanks a lot, Eric, for that generous introduction. Um, I want to begin actually uh, by um, noticing as you all have perhaps noticed yourselves that we are well into our second week of the coup in Burma, the military coup in Burma. Um, and um, there are a whole series of efforts that uh, are underway to provide some international support uh, for the nonviolent resistance in Burma. Uh, and I'm going to have Chris put up, um, there, there are going to be other opportunities, uh, including uh, efforts to raise subsistence funds for all the doctors and teachers and civil servants who are on strike. Um, and I have contributed actually a good part of my royalties for the last 10 years to the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners in Burma. It's an association of ex-prisoners that takes care of prisoners by sending them food, uh, medicines, taking care of their families, uh, and taking care of them when and if they're uh, released. Um, and so uh, I think Chris will put up um, the, um, the easiest way to contribute uh, is via um, the campaign for the Rohingya um, in which the money would be forwarded to the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners. Uh, they provide, by the way, if you go to their website, AAPPB, Burma, um, they provide a daily briefing on what's happening in Burma now. Um, and I uh, recommend that as a source for day-to-day -day information on the current situation in Burma. So thank you. Um, and I'll move now to my talk, if I may. Um, the, the talk is called In Praise of Floods. Um, the, I've been teaching a seminar on rivers uh, called Rivers, Nature, and Politics for the last seven or eight years. And historically, I've done actually a fair amount of canoeing and fishing on American uh, rivers and spent a long time uh, on the Irrawaddy uh, in Burma until the pandemic. And in fact, um, although I was interested in the river itself, uh, the river was also partly an excuse for me that I wanted to make sure that no matter where I was in Burma, um, that if the police asked what I was doing, I could say I was studying the Irrawaddy because I would always be close to a tributary or a distributary of the Irrawaddy, no matter where I was in Burma. Uh, although that would not hold if I were in Kentung in the sort of um, Eastern Shan state. Um, but I, I date the germ of this talk actually to an encounter I had something like 20 years ago. Um, I found myself at a conference in which there were hydrologists and Southeast Asianists, so two separate uh, meetings going on, but we were all at the same conference site. And they wanted us to be uh, good um, companions to one another. So they ordered us at lunch and dinner to intersperse ourselves and carry on conversations across uh, disciplines and interests. And I found myself sitting next to a very smart and interesting Philippine hydrologist um, and uh, trying to be a good boy and make conversation with him. I tried to think, well, what can we talk about? And I had learned 
in the last two or three years before this meeting that the Colorado River never got to the sea for a large part of the year. And um, I was sad for the Colorado River. It seemed to me all our metaphors about rivers running to the sea, um, that it, it just gave me a sense of um, uh, sympathy for the Colorado that it didn't get to do its thing and run to the sea like all rivers should. And so I, I tried to start the conversation uh, by saying to the hydrologist that I had learned this about the Colorado and wasn't it too bad the Colorado didn't get to the sea. And he turned to me very quickly and uh, with a stentorian voice and said, no, no, it's the most wonderful thing in the world. It means that every drop of the Colorado River is used for some important human purpose and not a drop goes to waste. And I realized from that moment, we were probably not gonna have a long conversation um, because he was, if you like, right, uh, a, um, uh, interested in the functionality for uh, Homo sapiens of the river and the uses to which it could be put. Um, he was not alone. Um, and here I want to quote Winston Churchill on the uh, Nile River. And I quote, one day, every last drop of water which drains into the whole valley of the Nile shall be equally and amicably divided among the river people and the Nile itself shall perish gloriously and never reach the sea. Uh, Joseph Stalin, who was less given to ornamental prose, uh, put it more succinctly, quote, water which is allowed to enter the sea is wasted, end quote. You could have had similar things uh, spoken by anyone from the American Bureau of Reclamation or the Army of Corps of Engineers uh, until very, very recently. Um, I want to begin actually uh, with a assertion that uh, everything moves um, and rivers too, of course. Um, but it seems to me that one of the problems uh, is that human, humans are inclined to thinking of units of a human life. Um, and we don't think of river time, of mountain time, of uh, tree time, uh, and so on, uh, let alone smaller units like insect time, you might uh, say. But if you open the temporal lens wide enough, everything moves. And uh, my illustration of this, um, let's see if this works. There we go. This is a 120,000 year video of the movement of the polar ice cap. You can see it moving. And the how many thousand years ago is up in the upper left-hand corner. You will see that 17 or 18,000 years ago was the last glacial maximum uh, after which uh, the, uh, ice, the polar cap uh, retreats and continues retreating today, of course. But you see the enormous, right, variation over time. Rivers like the St. Lawrence Seaway were essentially the breaking up of a glacial lake called Lake Agassiz um, right after the last glacial maximum. So now that's the last glacial maximum. And then there's the retreat. Um, the picture I would have preferred to show you, although I couldn't get an animation of it, is that after the last glacial maximum, we think of trees, for example, as being static and being in, not moving, but in fact, they're moving all the time. And it's again, opening the temporal lens. So if you were to have a time elapsed photograph after uh, the last glacial maximum, 
you would see century by century, the oaks and the beaches moving north from the Mediterranean um, as the climate improved and things got warmer. Uh, and so the trees would be moving and bringing together with them their soils, the insects, the animals and so on uh, that are part of the uh, larger ecosystem of, uh, of boreal forests. I want to uh, next move to, there we go. These are actually prepared by the Army Corps of Engineers. This is about a thousand year depiction of the different bends and channels uh, of the Mississippi River. The white portion um, is the current um, channel of the Mississippi River. Uh, but you get some sense uh, for uh, where the Mississippi has been and some sense for where it might go were it not chained. This is another version uh, of the river, I think near St. Louis, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the uh, other example that's uh, quite famous is the Yellow River uh, estuary. There are major shifts north and south of the Shandong Peninsula from 20, uh, 2200 BC. Um, and the second slide shows shifts in the major distributors, distributaries of the Yellow River in the last two centuries alone. Um, it's a huge variation. And in fact, the second to last um, movement of the major channel uh, of the Yellow River to the uh, sea um, was in 1938 when Chiang Kai-shek broke the dikes of the Yellow River in order to send it south in order to impede the Japanese advance uh, to the north. It was successful, but it cost something like um, 300,000 lives. The process of this change has all to do with the gradient of the coastal plain. That is to say, if the gradient is very low, the river slows down and as it slows, the sediment it carries settles out and raises the riverbed. Over time, it's self damming. That is to say, it creates its own levee ahead of it. And then it spreads laterally and seeks another path to the sea. As a new channel is clogged over time, the river may go back to an older channel that is now a faster way to the sea. The process is natural though the amount of sediment can vastly be increased, of course, by deforestation in the watershed. And of course, the river is likely to build new land in the estuary itself. Each flood raises the land flooded by the deposition of sediment so that the floodplain of the Middle Nile, for example, is now 10 feet higher than it was 5,000 years ago. George Perkins Marsh actually understood all of this in his magnificent book, Man and Nature, published in 1864. Thus, river port towns and coastal towns at a river's mouth are vulnerable to being blocked by the buildup of silt and sand. The most famous example of this, I think, is Bruges, the great linen center. Uh, its river, the artery, uh, and, and the artery that made it Bruges as a linen center was the Zwin River. It silted up in the 15th century and the merchants left for Antwerp, leaving this urban uh, 16th century gem as a kind of museum piece that we can admire today. On the Upper Rhine, for example, Brizac in Roman times was on the left bank and the, the, the 10th century, it was on an island in the 13th century on the left bank again and in the 14th century up till today, it was on the right bank. Um, so this movement is constant uh, over time. And in my personal experience, we have uh, a summer cabin in central Pennsylvania, um, which we would go to every summer for uh, the better part of a decade with the children. And I observed each year the, uh, what's called the accretion or carving out by the ice in the spring um, of each meander and had this sense for the slow change in 
the course of the river. Uh, but I was misled by this gradual change because in 1972, there was a huge flood. And I realized that 99% of the change in this creek came during the high water of this massive flood, two or three hours, right, in 1972, that cut off meanders, leaving oxbows, and so on. Um, and that this is called in international law avulsion rather than accretion. Um, and that most of the great changes in the river are these catastrophic events of massive uh, high water moments. Um, I want to show. Um, This is the process of creating oxbows. Um, this is an oxbow that has been recently cut off, as you can see. And the next flood, you can see an oxbow that whose uh, lifetime is limited probably uh, to the next great flood because that, that loop to your left will be cut off uh, as well. I'm going to leave up uh, of the Irrawaddy River, um, uh, at which its major tributaries uh, to the north are the Malika and Maika uh, that join the, to create the Irrawaddy uh, north of Michina, uh, that then flows south to Mandalay. It's joined by the Chindwin, right? Uh, and if I had a map of the Irrawaddy over time, um, it's been changed radically, its channel by volcanic uh, events. The Sitang uh, River was in fact the channel of the Irrawaddy to the sea uh, in geological times. Um, and after the eruption of Mount Popa and so on, uh, the bed of the Irrawaddy was changed quite radically. The, Irrawaddy is moving all the time. Uh, and I want to give you a sense of this. Uh, on one trip downstream from Mandalay to the ancient capital of Pagan, it was a, day, a day's trip. Um, a small inboard motorboat carrying uh, no more than 20 passengers. What was interesting to me is that we used four pilots whom we picked up along the way. And each of these pilots was an expert in um, a section of the river, uh, and essentially a two hour sail uh, down the river. Um, and after their knowledge ran out, they would get off um, and we would take on another pilot who was an expert for the next little patch of the river because this, and these people had worked at these jobs for 20, 30 years. So, the captain of the boat who'd been going up and down the Irrawaddy for a long, long time, he did not trust himself to understand the different shifts um, in the sandbanks and channel day by day and week by week um, without using these pilots. And still, uh, in this case, we didn't get stuck, but in many cases, uh, uh, even with these pilots, it's not very uncommon to be uh, to be stuck. And the larger cargo carriers, especially during uh, low water in February and March, um, the danger uh, was much greater. And there are many of the larger cargo carriers that are irretrievably stuck and have to wait until the monsoon season in order to be floated off uh, the, uh, the mud banks or sand banks in which they're um, embedded. Um, the next I want to show, um, this is a, a common site on uh, some of the larger passenger boats. And you see that long bamboo pole, uh, and it is a depth gauge. There are two of them, usually at the, um, uh, at the prow um, of uh, each boat. And uh, when they are in shallow waters, there are two people shouting out um, the depth of the river from both sides of the boat, actually. Um, and it's, uh, they're yelling more than five feet, less than four feet, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is exactly 
kind of Mark Twain's point on life in the Mississippi, marking on the twine, right, is the uh, equivalent of the Mississippi river boats that had to do precisely the same thing. And still, it was very common for the boats to be stuck. You may wonder what these people are doing in the water. First of all, notice how shallow it is, right? Um, this uh, passenger uh, boat has uh, become stuck. And what they've done is to send uh, two or three members of the crew out and they have a stake, I have a close up. They have a stake which they embed in the sand of the river. They will then attach that to a cable which will then be attached to a winch at the back of the boat that will winch it, uh, will, will winch it in and winch it out. And the idea is to wiggle uh, the prow of the boat until it, it can be backed off the um, uh, bank in which it's embedded. The engines are of course going in reverse, uh, but the winching is necessary in order to uh, unembed it. And that's why actually the ships going downstream in low water have the right of way because if you get stuck going downstream, the current is your enemy because it embeds you deeper and it's harder to back off. Uh, whereas the ships going upstream um, uh, don't have the right of way because it's much easier for them to get off. Um, The variation over time, one more thing about rivers as living things, um, it helps to tell us that ideas such as the 100 year flood or 50 year flood that you hear all the time in weather reports and uh, disaster reports is, and I choose my words carefully, nonsense. Um, that is to say, um, the for example, the Rhine had four 100 year floods in 12 years, in 1983, 88, 93, and 94. That should give one some pause over the meaning of a 100 year flood. Why? For most rivers, not quite all of them, we simply don't have the statistical series on water levels and volume flows that go back more than 100 or 200 years which would even in principle allow us to make such a statistical generalization. Now the Yellow River or the Yangtze or the Rhine or Danube or Euphrates are partial exceptions to this and we have a longer statistical series. But more important, even if we did have a deep series, the assumption behind the 100 year flood and the 50 year flood is the assumption of hydrological equilibrium. But it's not the same river from year to year. It's moving silt and sand and clay. It's carving new channels and meanders. Its normal flood stage is building natural levees. And if we add anthropogenic changes in particular, it's radically not the same river. That is to say in 1800, most of the Mississippi bank was forested but by 1960, 95% was planted to agricultural crops. Forget about all the other interventions which were made into the river. Now I want to talk, my, my problem in my seminar with students in, on rivers uh, was that um, they're mostly interested in actually like the Philippine hydrologist I mentioned, they're interested in the uses of the river for homo sapiens, for drinking water, for irrigation, um, et cetera, uh, flood control. And um, I hope when I write the book about the Irrawaddy, because I have a lot of data on fish migrations uh, and so on, uh, and migrations of birds and uh, riverine mammals as well, uh, to talk more about all those creatures that depend on the river for their life world, including uh, clams and mussels, shellfish uh, and uh, larvae. The most important movement in the annual life of the river is what is called the flood pulse. It's a very, I think, important 
choice of terms. That is to say that part of the year during which the river overflows its natural channel and occupies its habitual floodplain. The pulse of high water may come from the monsoon, from snow or glacial melt, or from seasonal rainfall. And it may be of different degrees of variability, but it is a completely natural part of the annual cycle of a river. The flooding of the floodplain represents the lungs of a river in a literal sense. That is to say the condition of its vitality and its nutrition and that of the creatures who depend on it. Without the annual flooding of the floodplain, the channel, which we usually associate with the river at rest in our paintings and photographs, is comparatively dead, biotically speaking. Flood as a scare word is so deeply anthropogenic that I want to ban its use, but it's not in my power, alas. Uh, it's just the river breathing as it must. On this view, we would understand a flooding of settlements near the river as the result of Homo sapiens encroaching on the natural plane of the river, that is to say, an act of trespass. The periodic flooding of the floodplain is the life world and condition of existence of all of the species that inhabit the river or who dwell along the river. And here, this is not, uh, this is an effort um, by a disturbance ecologist to show you uh, the, uh, how the level of a river over time uh, brings nutrients to higher and higher ground uh, and, then, uh, and then retreats. Um, fish, for example, get as much as 80% of their total annual nutrition from the huge pulse of food that the flood stage affords as they spread out over the floodplain. There they spawn and put on weight. They feed on the invertebrates, the decaying organic matter, the microbes that are on the floodplain. There's almost always a huge migration of fish to take advantage of this feeding fren frenzy. Uh, Anadromous fish that uh, come in from the sea for that matter uh, are there in partly, uh, in, in large part for this sea pulse event. Um, the floodplain may be 40 times wider than the channel. In places like the Amazon, where there's a huge variation, you have fruit eating fish for the simple reason that the water level gets so high that the fish can uh, profit from what we call the low hanging fruit uh, that uh, are on the adjacent uh, banks. Um, the Mississippi fish catch had declined more than 80% uh, in the years up to 1993. But the result of the 1993 massive flood was that the fish catch in the year afterwards was a new record. And the year after that also a new record because of the spawning um, and greater population of fish. The studies of the Danube have shown that the greater the extent of the flood in a given year, the greater the haul of fish. By the way, it's not just fish, of course, but a whole cavalcade of all those creatures that depend on a concentration of nutrition. Waterfowl, who are there because the birds are there, in the along the Irrawaddy, the way in which fishermen can tell that there's a migration of fish coming is that the birds appear before the fish migrate because they've, in a sense, learned further downstream that the fish are on the way. Uh, and they precede the fish uh, and wait for their uh, feast. Uh, and the fishermen then know it's time to get out the nets and get ready for uh, the migration of fish. Um, waterfowl and riverine wetland birds um, in the West, uh, heron, muskrats, fox, wolves, raptors, herbivores, come, um, they come for the fresh grouse, excuse me, fresh grass sprouting after the flood recedes and all the microparasites that feed on this cavalcade. And then as the flood recedes, much of this nutrition returns to the channel where some of the larger fish, channel cats and dolphins can benefit from it, as well as the comparatively immobile 
shellfish, clams, and bottom larvae. That is to say, the flood pulse brings back to the channel nutrition that it would not otherwise have, uh, that it collects, if you like, from the floodplain. So what the flood does in one sense is to provide connectivity. It moves water over the landscape, creating a huge variety of habitats. Backwaters, ponds, marsh environments, slow moving water, a warmer water, refugees, uh, refuges from larger predators, varied assemblages of food and habitat that favor different riverine species. The whole mechanism depends on the microbial richness of the floodplain that represents the base of the food pyramid and the entire life world of the river. Without the flood pulse then, the river is comparatively dead. I mean to emphasize non-human species here, but let me say a bit about the flood, what the flood pulse does for Homo sapiens, the most numerous and most successful invasive species the world has known. Well, what it does is civilization. No floodplain, no civilization. That's something of a slight exaggeration, but not great, not a great exaggeration. Almost without exception, all archaic civilizations were founded on floodplains, often near the estuary of a river. Why? That's the only place where you can have a concentration of foodstuffs and people in a small circumference in which state making is possible. Observe what the flood does. It drowns all the competing vegetation, AKA weeds. It lays down a layer of nutritious silt that provides nutrients to the crops, usually cereal grains. It provides, if it's well behaved as the Nile Valley generally is, a perfectly harrowed field ready for sowing, no plowing needed, just broadcast the seeds. In a sense, the flood does the agricultural work except for the sowing and the harvesting. In the same way, by the way, if you, the com comparable case for um, inland agriculture in the hills is shifting or fire field cultivation or slash and burn cultivation in which the job of uh, that water does in uh, what I call flood recession agriculture, uh, what the, the job that fire does is exactly the, what water does in flood recession agriculture. That is to say, uh, it burns uh, the organic matter, provides um, uh, fertilizer. And all the, all the fields have to be moved from time to time. Uh, it's essentially the same uh, process. Um, the, um, hence the oldest form of agriculture was it's called flood recession agriculture, or in French, la cultivation uh, des crues. Um, it, uh, it's also common in Eastern woodland uh, agriculture in among uh, Native Americans. Uh, these would be the places along streams that were annually flooded that would be the places where Native Americans would do uh, early uh, planting. Make sure I've got the, here we go. Um, this is a, um, uh, an island uh, in the upper uh, Irrawaddy and it is a completely flood recession agriculture. Um, and it, it is something like um, five or 600 uh, acres. Um, that is recreated every year and that six villages share or fight about, I should say, uh, in terms of who gets what, because uh, this uh, patch is changing every year, depending on the accumulation of silt uh, and soil. But it's a major agricultural site. And there is a bamboo bridge rebuilt nearly two miles long. Uh, built every year in order that people can get from one bank to this island uh, in in the middle. And in the delta, the Irrawaddy Delta, um, 
there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, such islands with complicated forms of property rights, uh, with efforts to shore up property rights by driving in bamboo stakes and making sure that the new silt accumulates on their side of the island rather than on another side of the island. So it's a whole world in which our sense of, if you like, land staying in place uh, doesn't hold. Uh, and it is, a, if you like, shifting floodplains uh, that are in the middle uh, of a river or offshore from its, uh, its banks. The best way, best way of understanding this is through what is often called disturbance ecology. I don't like the term disturbance because it risks obscuring the fact that floods are often annual, natural, and fairly predictable. That is to say, they're not disturbances at all, or such disturbances are normal, cyclical. But it is proposed in contrast to distinction to equilibrium analysis, in which the succession and distribution of fish and insects and birds reached a terminal state that was stable. As we shall, shall see, it's the prevention or the forceful stopping of these natural perturbations that is the real disturbance, the real intervention, the attempt to enforce a permanent equilibrium. Natural disturbances create new mosaics of plants and animals and insects. They open the canopy, they destroy or displace many species, but they begin a new succession of colonists. The result is more biodiversity in terms of the variety of species and this mosaic of patches that is in turn more resilient. It's worth recalling what the flood accomplishes. It eliminates much previous vegetation. It soaks the soil differently, uh, deeply. It brings in nutritious silt. Uh, and it is an open and inviting environment waiting to be colonized by flood adapted marine life, by flood adapted insect life, by flood adapted flora, seeds that have been waiting for a long, long time. Quick colonizing species from adjacent patches um, a slower colonization from further away. It's a favorable spawning environment for a selection of fish, insects, and birds who do best in uncrowded open environments. It creates then innumerable edge environments or ecotones that are, as we know, species rich because they provide access to two or more environments, sometimes seasonal. This is what happens without humans. Humans can use and shape this process. So along the Nile, just poking a hole in the natural levees of the river at a flood stage could inundate the back slopes and hollows with silt rich water. And then when the water had soaked in, one could plant wheat or barley and no state was needed. So the, uh, if you like, the agriculture along the Nile River was a completely village affair, had nothing to do with pharaohs uh, and state-like entities uh, creating irrigation. Flood recession agriculture is simplest. It just uses nature to work with a little nudge. Now, um, how am I doing in terms of time, uh, Eric? Five minutes? Jim, you have a little bit more than five minutes is good. Yeah. I'm sorry. I've got to put on my, yeah. You have five, five minutes. Okay, good. Uh, what we've done with rivers is to simplification, simplify them by engineering. Humankind has of course been sculpting rivers for its purposes forever, but only with the invention of dynamite in 1870 and subsequent earth moving machinery and reinforced concrete has this sculpting taking on protean proportions. As you know, one of the interesting things about the Irrawaddy is that uh, the Irrawaddy does not have any dams on its main stem. Um, the effort to build a dam at the uh, Mietzon, 
uh, at the origin of the Irrawaddy, which was underway actually, and was stopped by um, uh, actually a democratic movement and a general's compliance with that democratic movement. Um, there are lots of dams north of the origin of the Irrawaddy on the tributaries that contribute to the Irrawaddy, and they've had a huge effect on the hydrology of the Irrawaddy, but the Irrawaddy itself is so far an undammed, uh, undammed river. Um, the engineering of rivers is, I like to think of it as some combination of taxidermy and amputation. Um, because the simplification of the, the effort of these interventions is usually to simplify the river and to have it serve a single functional purpose. The Rhine is a striking example. Johann Gottfried Tula, around 1800, uh, responsible for a treaty called the rectification of the Rhine among the, all the adjacent Rhine nations. Um, the wonderful word rectification of the Rhine is a, is a wonderful term as if God had somehow, if you'll excuse the expression, fucked up and that the Rhine had to be rectified from its original um, form. Um, the, it was an actual treaty. It eliminated meanders, removed barriers in the channel. It confined the river to a single bed with no braids, to a uniform width where possible, to a uniform depth and a uniform speed of current. That is to say, the effort was to turn the Rhine into a canal so far as was possible. Predictable, uniform, straight, obeying Bernoulli's principle of pressure and turbulence. To take a variable and turn it into a constant. The Rhine was shortened by 105 kilometers and it lost 80% of its floodplain in the uh, upper Rhine. I'm going to go through, um, skip some things. I, I should add, hang on. There's the Rhine. Uh, you can see the old Rhine and uh, the new reformed uh, Rhine uh, as it was uh, shortened over time. Uh, the section that I skipped over, by the way, is a section on the way in which um, uh, people run away, running away from states um, have run to marshes and wetlands um, uh, because they're extremely hard to police, whether it's the marsh Arabs, whether it's the Great Dismal Swamp that held more than 6,000 runaway slaves at the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, marshes and swamps have been, in, if, if you like, refugees, uh, refuges over time uh, for um, uh, people wanting to evade the state for one reason or another. Uh, the, the result of the rectification of the Rhine is that a drop of water that falls in Switzerland now uh, takes only three days to get to Holland, whereas before it took something like 10 days. The results of this for catastrophic floods and high water are something that you can appreciate and the degree to which uh, a big rainfall is quickly channeled into the river uh, because of the changes of uh, its banks and the changes in the channel. George Perkins Marsh understood this as a simple matter of physics. Say a river has 1600, a 1600 mile course. Say the natural channel drops 800 feet from the origin to the sea. That's a drop of six inches to the mile. By shortening the river and cutting off meanders, let's say you make it only 1200 miles long. Then the pitch is increased to eight inches to the mile. It's only two inches, uh, it's one quarter. Um, uh, steeper, but it has tremendous effects on the speed, on how much silt it carries, on the height of probable flood crests, on the erosion of banks. 
And if you then try to minimize floods by preventing lateral movement of river water by levees, you increase the amount of silt carried to the mouth. The silting up of the Dutch estuary is a good example. As Aldo Leopold once wrote, <clears throat> the Germans had a fondness for unnecessary outdoor geometry. Other simplifications are hydroelectric dams and irrigation, which create chains of lakes, still water, which destroys fish migrations in both directions and prevents the natural conveyor belt of silt downriver, prevents the natural, move, natural movement of the river. It raises the question of when is a river still a river? How many things can you do to a river and still call it a river? I, I once had a colleague in Wisconsin um, who had a cat. And um, since I was in Wisconsin for the better part of a decade, I, I would visit them, this family often, I will not name them. And the cat, uh, somehow the, its tail had been docked for some reason. Um, it had been neutered. Uh, and shortly in the year before I left, since it was tearing up the furniture, it had been declawed. And my wife and I, um, on the way back uh, from this visit, wondered to one another, how many things could you take away from a cat and still have a cat? And somehow the, the declawing of a cat seemed somehow to be um, uh, over, the, over the red line. But I think it's worth saying what happens uh, in the engineering of a river, uh, which is never completely successful, by the way, when you try to turn it into a canal, uh, a pipe, um, a, uh, a chain of lakes that can be used for irrigation uh, and so on. Um, I wanna, um, one of the results of, um, this effort to control a river. Um, this is the Yellow River near Kaifeng. Um, and because of the use of levees over time, it's a rich agricultural area. And as the river carried more silt and therefore the bed of the river got higher and higher and higher in order to prevent catastrophic floods, the levees were built higher and higher and higher over time. So that now at Kaifeng, uh, at least when this book was this book was written, from which the image is taken, the river was uh, 33 feet above the surrounding floodplain. So you may want to call that a river, but to me it looks a lot more like an aqueduct, uh, and it's an aqueduct that's been made by the engineering of the river that gradually increased its. Um, uh, uh, its bed, the, the height of its bed, and necessitated, if you wanted to uh, protect the farmland around it, who were tax-paying farmers and so on, uh, then you built the levees higher and higher and higher. And it set the stage for catastrophic floods. Um, so when a flood then does occur, it's likely to be a massive and enormous flood. And I want to wind up here, and I, it, this uh, requires me to vastly shorten um, the last part of the talk, uh, but I'll try to summarize it briefly. There's something in medicine called iatrogenic illnesses, uh, which are a fancy term for the cure being worse than the disease. Um, it, the super bugs that one finds in hospitals that in a sense by trying to stop small infections with antibiotics, you create the selection pressures that increase over time, the bacteria that are able to survive these uh, insults uh, and uh, poisons uh, and still survive. And then you create superbugs that thrive in hospitals and so on. Um, I won't go into this, but iatrogenic medicine is extremely important. A tremendous number of the hospitalizations that occur are in a sense, the result of treatment uh, rather than um, uh, the illness itself. So the treatment. So I want to argue that the, um, the effort to prevent small infections results in large infections. The result to prevent small floods. And there you have political lock-in because um, 
representatives want to preserve the population because they're paying taxes because they vote for them and will do anything they can to preserve the real estate values. Um, you get this political lock-in uh, as well. And the result is then a, um, and it's here forest fires are a good analogy. The effort for 60 years by the forest service to prevent all fires resulted in catastrophic fires because of the buildup of combustible materials, right? And the prevention of natural fires. And in the same way, uh, there's an iatrogenic process in which the effort to present, prevent small floods um, uh, has resulted in large floods. The 1993 uh, flood of the Mississippi and Missouri is a good example. And now the most, the smallest, <clears throat> most hesitant and timid efforts are being made um, to restore floodplains um, and wetlands that have been destroyed, uh, but to an extent that is so um, trivial and timid that um, it has not made much of a dent in the, if you like, the death of rivers or the maiming of rivers or the taxidermy of rivers. Uh, that we experience. Let me stop there. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jim, for that fascinating talk. Let's take a moment um, and and thank Jim for the talk. Um, if you want to um, take a moment to clap, so I don't mistake your clapping for your raised hands, um, I'll take a moment. So. What we'll do here is if you can raise your hand using the hand raise function of, of Zoom, uh, please do that. If you can't figure out how to do that, send a text to me uh, via the chat. Um, and if you can't figure out how to do that, wave your hand uh, wildly on the screen and hopefully I'll see it eventually. Um, and I'll keep track of it. The first hand that was up was Paul Sarno. After that, it will be Michael Dove. And then I'll type a list in, of the order in the chat. Um, so let's start with Paul and, and please keep your um, questions relatively brief if you don't mind, because I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of uh, questions uh, to, on the table. So thank Hi, you. Hi Paul. Hi Jim, thank you very much. I, I have a, a layman's question. It, it sounds like from what you're saying, it's not a good idea to dam up rivers. And if that's true, does that mean the major reason, one of the major reasons I thought for damming up the river is you can get a lot of hydropower and it, that was relatively clean energy. Am I correct in those suppositions that it's not a good idea to dam up rivers and not a good idea to dam up even tributaries? Well, if, if, you're, if you're focused on how much power you can generate relatively cleanly for Homo sapiens, the answer is you're right. If you're interested in the life world of the river and the migrating fish uh, and the life forms that depend on the natural processes of the river uh, and of its floods and so on, then for them, it's almost certain death. Um, and so it depends whether that's the point. It depends whether you're focusing, you know, I suppose wind and solar are rather better than hydroelectric. And there are, by the way, mm. small dams, uh, run of the river dams. I mean, there, it's, you know, there's a topology of dams um, in which, um, uh, which are more or less destructive uh, as dams in terms of the natural processes of the river. So the World Commission on Dams actually has a set of principles that it established. This is after the Narmada Dam protest um, uh, for dams that are well, okay, uh, if not, you know, uh, uh, entirely approved. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Paul, for that question. And uh, Michael. Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, this was fascinating, Jim. I, I was interested in your likening of the impacts of flooding to, to the impacts of fire in the hills. So this, this gives us two pulses to compare, a pulse from wet to dry to wet, and in the hills, a pulse 
from field to forest, back to field. So two different pulses. And it seems like these, these pulses have been problematic for land tenure, at least the way outsiders view land tenure. So I'm wondering if you can place the tenurial implications of these pulses in the longer history of, of, of land tenure for fixed land within which these seem to be, as I said, problematic. I'm thinking um, the uh, I suppose uh, maybe this is what you're implying um, in your comments. Um, that I was interested in the nutrient cycle of silt versus, you know, fire and the way in which it provided the basis for cropping. Uh, but you raise the question, which is even more interesting in many ways, uh, which is the our our idea of property that is based on um, fixed borders um, and fixed tenure and titles, when uh, in fact, in the flood recession agriculture that I'm talking about, the land is shifting all the time uh, under the pressure of floods and the deposition of silt and sand and gravel. Um, and um, for uh, slash and burn agriculture, uh, shifting agriculture, um, it requires that in a sense, the fields be moved, but it, it's within, as you know a lot better than I do, uh, it's within a fixed compass uh, by and large, uh, or if you like a rotation of fallowing, um, and uh, the, it's, as again, what's interesting is in terms of customary land tenure, the people who are not planning particular Sweden are likely to have recognized rights uh, to the um, things that are popping up in the Sweden anyway, uh, and the right to return to it. Is that correct? Yes. I'm not sure I answered your question, Michael. I, I would like to hear a lecture from you on the comparison. <laughs> that was great. Thanks, Jim. I think we can have a special workshop on this topic uh, with Michael and Jim meeting head to head. Uh, we have a question from Jacob. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Scott. That was uh, really interesting. I, I really uh, uh, appreciated hearing about um, all the river meandering issues, which is something that's certainly been on my mind uh, recently. I guess I'm gonna keep my question short as requested. I'm wondering about the implications of a world of re-liberated rivers where they're permitted to meander, they're permitted to be dynamic and they're permitted to have their flood cycles. The implications for um, human settlement, urbanization, town and city location patterns, implications for transportation. I was struck by your example of the temporary seasonal bamboo bridge. I've seen bridges like that in, Aruna, in Arunachal Pradesh uh, in, in India at a particular river location where during some times of the year you get across on a ferry boat and in other times of year you have to use an elephant to wade across or the elephant swim in the deep part of the channel with people on its back. And then in another time of year when it's appropriate you have this temporary bridge. Um, and that's really neat at that particular location. It's a village called Dambuk. But if we're talking about re-liberating the entire lower Rhine or the entire lower Mississippi, um, what happens to town and uh, city settlements? What happens to road infrastructure? How do people get from point A to point B? Um, if, if even even if, uh, if, if rivers are constantly meandering, then that means that sandbars are constantly being rearranged. So even things like uh, having regular ferry routes might be difficult. So I'm wondering how, how could you kind of um, reintegrate those kinds of human needs with these, with re-liberated rivers? Uh, it's a great question. And um, 
my my job is to diagnose where we are, not how we get out of it. Um, the um, and so I don't have uh, a, a lot. What's what's interesting to me, for example, um, is that th there were. Um, this is actually covered kind of brilliantly in Mark Elvin's *The Retreat of the Elephants*, uh, since you mentioned elephants. Um, the difference between the confu there were there were uh, traditionally in China um, river masters, uh, and there were two schools of river mastery: a Confucian school and a Taoist school. Uh, and the Confucian school was sort of like the Army Corps of Engineers, more or less. Let's make the river do what we want it to do. Um, uh, and the, uh, the Taoist school was to try to work within the limits of the river's natural movement. So they would have, for example, gates or sluices that would be overspill sluices that would only open when the pressure of the water reached a certain level naturally without any human intervention. They, would, they were engineered that way. Um, the, uh, the other example that is an accommodation, I think it's above St. Louis on the Mississippi River uh, in which a whole series of areas were um, uh, recently developed and were destroyed something like two or three times in a course of 20 years. Um, and the result was actually to forbid rebuilding in those areas. Uh, first of all, it was hard to get insurance for them as you might imagine uh, the third time around. Um, and the result was that you had this land was actually very good agricultural land and very good for uh, sports um, field land. Uh, it just couldn't have permanent structures uh, on it. So most of the year it was perfectly usable, um, but it was um, uh, unoccupied and a potential floodplain in those areas where uh, when the river uh, rose. So it was, a, if you like, an overspill. And it ended up protecting um, downriver settlements that were um, uh, otherwise in danger. Uh, if there were not this overspill area. There's, there's a history, by the way, um, uh, of uh, struggle between uh, settlements on opposite sides of a river that's in flood stage uh, of who's going to break the dikes on which side. Um, and so there, there's a whole Japanese literature on uh, people rolling over from one village to break the dikes on their competing settlement on the other side of the river so that it releases the pressure on them. Um, and uh, there's a, uh, in a sense, there's a, uh, there, there, I think, are a series of accommodations. So the, the, the problem, the reason why I don't think it has a solution in your terms is because of political lock-in. Uh, that you have, if you like, a whole series of investment, uh, population, congressional districts, um, uh, industries, and so on, that are built on the floodplain, um, and that uh, can, in a sense, mandate the public expenditure uh, in order to protect them, um, and also lobby the government for uh, reduced insurance rates in order to protect them with the result, of course, that you have, you set yourself up for larger disasters over time, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, uh, Jacob, for that question. Um, now we have a question from Ian Baird, who's probably, who's coming in from Madison, probably defending the cats of Madison, as well as having a question. Well, I, 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 won't, <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't make any comments about the cats, but, um, I will say that that was a great talk and uh, thank you so much for that. I just wanted to add one uh, aspect to, to what you presented, which relates to this I, an idea of energy. So, and I, when I talk about energy, I'm not talking about electricity that's produced or energy that's you know given to human use. I'm talking about the energy of the river when it flows downstream. And one of the things that happens in the Irrawaddy and also in the Mekong where I work 
is um, when fish migrate upstream, um, many of them migrate upstream and then they, they spawn upstream. And then it coincides with the increasing of the, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the monsoon rains and the increasing of the size of the river. And the energy of the river actually uh, helps those small larvae that are, that are, that are born to, to flow down the river. You know, um, and one of the, the, the huge impacts of hydropower dams, big dams, is actually they stop the energy. What they do is they, you, you think the dams produce energy, well they do, but they stop the energy in the sense that they often create reservoirs. And so those fish or larvae that are flowing downstream all of a sudden reach the, the, the reservoir and then the, 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 the speed slows down and these larvae kind of drop out and often get trapped in the reservoir. And even if they could make it through the turbines further downstream, they don't because of the disruption of the energy flow of the river itself or the, or the life pulse, if you might put it that way. So I think that that's just another way of, I think, adding to what's already a great uh, presentation of the ecological aspects and how they're very much related. I mean, the Mekong itself has the, the largest freshwater fishery in the world. And, you know, this disruption of flow and, you know, similarly with the Irrawaddy, uh, if they were to build a dam on the mainstream or even on many tributaries for that matter, you know, has really a devastating impact. Right, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I want to start by saying I've learned a lot about the Mekong and about uh, rivers from uh, reading your, uh, some of your work on the Mekong. Um, the, I think it's not appreciated. Um, we, we're very much aware these days of 4,000 mile migrations by birds uh, annually, right? Uh, and the importance of these flyways and so on. And I think we don't realize uh, the extraordinary distances of anadromous and um, I forget what the, old, the, the, um, the antonym is for that, um, that fish that, that breed in freshwater and go to saltwater. And that hydromous? Right, hydromous, right. Um, that what, that we don't, the, the, the extent of migrations is of distances that are astounding, just as astounding as they are for birds of four, five, six, seven thousand uh, miles. I mean, the, the, the movement of eels, for example, in the Pacific uh, and so on. And so when you, it, it's as if you somehow had a barrier that destroyed the flyway for bird migrations. Every time you put in a dam, not only is the still water much less nutritious and much less biotically alive than moving water, uh, but you also prevent the movement, uh, nutrition, and the, in a sense, the life world. This is their medium, right? Uh, they, for them, the river is their life world. And that's why, um, you know, we may not want to sacrifice uh, the last ounce of kilowatts that we can get from uh, a dam, um, but uh, there are other ways we can get most, much of our power um, without uh, destroying the life world of a whole spectrum of species that depend on it. And who knows what uh, their effects are in the long run if they're lost. Thanks, Jim. Um, so we have a, a few more minutes and we have several more questions. Um, I wanna ask Jim, do you mind uh, continuing to answer questions for another eight minutes or so? Sure, of course. Okay, so the next question from John Seidel. After John is oh Michael God, Van. Just let me, after John will be Michael Van, then um, Alan Popkin, Jamie Anderson, and Hans Steinmuller. So you can see there's a fair number of questions. Um, let's, let's have John, Hi, John ask his, and then we'll see how far we get in that list. Hi, Go John. Ahead, John. Hi, Jim. Nice to see you. You're the, the last person I've had an indoor meal with, uh, other than my family. <laughs> <laughs> On March 
on yeah, March exactly. 16th or something. Yeah, exactly. Um, brilliant talk, uh, wonderful to, to get a sense of the, the forthcoming book. And one thing I was struck by was the sort of characteristic reference to a, a variety of different rivers um, and commonalities across them. But I, I guess my question is whether there reaches a point in human history, uh, recent history, where we find that what happens in one river uh, happens in other rivers, not only simultaneously, more or less, but in an interconnected fashion. So for example, we know from Mark Elvin what happens to uh, the Pearl River Delta um, with uh, silk cultivation. Um, but then that has knock-on effects in terms of stimulating uh, demand for uh, rice um, uh, from elsewhere. So this then impacts on the Mekong, arguably, maybe in the Red River Delta as well. And it could even be that if you go back to the conditions that, uh, that stimulate uh, French um, demand for Chinese silk, that they come from things that happened in rivers, you know, the Loire, the Rhone in, in France, who knows, it might be there, I'm not sure. But in other words, does there come a point where what happens in one river, you know, happens in all rivers or, or that that interconnectedness with steamboats and otherwise takes on a kind of uh, catalytic effect, a uh, kind of multiplier effect uh, that, that, so you can't study one river without running into uh, the impact of other rivers. The, the histories are intertwined, uh, as it were. I'm, um, that's a rich question and could, uh, could go in many different directions in terms of um, talking about it. The, it seems to me it's actually, it's, it's useful actually to, um, once you get uh, steam power, and you get these enormous sort of barges um, that can carry huge bulk goods on on navigable rivers like the Mississippi and the Rhine and so on. That's what, and they're designed and engineered and transformed for exactly uh, that purpose. They 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 carry bulk goods, especially they're they are superior to any other form of transportation where it's available. Um, uh, for all goods that have a relatively low uh, value per unit weight and volume. So that, for example, that's why the Missis lower Mississippi is the cotton cultivation, right? Uh, and its consequences, the, uh, the shipping of grain, um, and of course, gravel and stone and charcoal and uh, timber, et cetera. Um, and so somehow it seems to me that that both the um, invention of steam power and the capacity to move an enormous amount uh, of cargo um, with relatively little friction, because that's what the river provides is important. Um, but I also, uh, it seems to me that our, our capacity to change the rivers, that's why I went out of my way to emphasize dynamite and reinforce concrete uh, and earth moving machinery uh, because our capacity to make rivers do what we want them to do in order to serve as um, vehicles, commerce and transportation uh, are dependent on those late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, and let me, let me also add, um, uh, uh, Ian would know this, and many of you would know this from uh, work on Asia, that in fact, and it's not just the Chinese, but it's especially the Chinese, um, there is a dam industrial complex uh, in which having dammed every river in China, um, all of these engineers and the capital are looking to build dams in Southeast Asia, in Africa, uh, just the way the Italians and Norwegians want to build tunnels everywhere in the world. Um, so there is, a, if you like, there's a, um, an enormous emphasis because you can prove uh, certain benefits. And there we could go into the cost benefit analysis that is so bogus with respect to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the 
rationale for dams in terms of their economic uh, benefits. Um, but it seems to me that there is, if you like, a kind of international combine of engineers, major corporations, state and non-state corporations for whom uh, river engineering is uh, their business. Uh, and they have an enormous amount of influence. Uh, it provides jobs, benefits, capital, um, and so on. And so that shouldn't be overlooked, I don't think. Thanks, Jim. Uh, now we have a question from Michael Van. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the great talk, Professor Scott. Uh, big fan of your work. Also, thank you to Yale for making this public. This is really the Zoom or the, the COVID silver lining for a lot of us, the Zoom talks. <laughs> um, just a real quick question. If the answer is no, move on to the next question. But if it's yes, um, I'd like to hear a little more. Do you find in your analysis of the rivers the term Anthropocene useful for categorizing historical development? If not, fine. But if yes, how? Um, what does the study of rivers tell us about uh, uh, conceptualizing the Anthropocene? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, that is to say, now I have to elaborate, don't I? Um, the uh, uh, well. If one of the ways in which I understand this is to take um, uh, George Perkins Marsh's book from 1864. Uh, and so he's operating at a time before at least the real growth of steam power. Um, and he understands the way in which deforestation and so on. So there, and it's not as if there's, it, it's what I would describe as a, a lighter, uh, thin Anthropocene that he's describing in the way in which we've changed uh, rivers. And it seems to me that uh, because of the technological uh, innovations that I mentioned of the dynamite and reinforced concrete, et cetera, uh, is that our capacity to intervene and reshape the landscape and the, and the hydrology of rivers uh, has grown at an exponential rate. Uh, and that as a, a result, it's become an important political resource for lots of uh, states. I think, you know, the, uh, uh, the Burmese military, right? As a specialist at building roads and dams and bridges, basically, that's all it does as near as I can tell. Um, so like an engineering military regime, uh, it's the, as if the Army Corps of Engineers took over the uh, United States. Um, but it seems to me that, uh, yes, I mean, uh, we can't, uh, it's hard to understand um, what's happened to rivers without these uh, anthropogenic in, uh, interventions. And the fact which I think is often overlooked is that in 1750, there were only three quarters of a billion of us. And now we're going on 8 billion. Uh, so it's not as if, you know, the uh, uh, anthropos, right? Anthropods that are screwing up the planet are uh, 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 eight times more numerous than they were, more than eight times more numerous than they were. Uh, in 1750. So that all by itself um, is an enormous burden on the resources that a river can provide. Thanks. Um, given the time, I, I'm going to ask if Alan Potkin, Jamie Anderson, and Hans Steinmuller um, might ask their questions together so that we can kind of see if there's a, a thread linking them together. I'm sorry to do that to all of you. I know you've been waiting patiently, but it is 122. And um, when we're finished, I'll leave the Zoom open for some informal chats and conversation for those who have the energy to hang out. Um, I'll do that for a while too. But so uh, Alan, I think you were first and then Jamie and then Hans, if you don't mind going in succession. 
Yeah, uh, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, uh, several years ago, I actually did a considerable amount of boat, boat travel on the Irrawaddy um, and made it as far above the proposed confluence dam at Mietzon as foreigners were allowed to go, and then traveled by boat all the way down, by steamer all the way down to Mandalay. Uh, I checked every fish store, fish market uh, that I could, and essentially there were no um, large native river species for sale in any of the fish markets. And there were hardly um, any small fishing boats compared especially to the Mekong anywhere along the Irrawaddy. Okay, that said, uh, Burma has 4,000 megawatts of hydropower of installed capacity, some coal, mostly hydropower. Uh, that's uh, a trivial amount and that's the main um, disincentive against economic development. Uh, the Mietzone projects alone would add something like 15 to 25,000 megawatts of that to that 4,000. And um, uh, you might want to look at the ebook. If you go into the chat file, you'll find a link to my online ebook on that subject. Um, I love rivers the same as everybody else here does, but um, sometimes it's necessary to get real with human needs. So pick that up however you see fit, but do look at the chat link to my ebook on that sub subject. Thanks. I, I shall do, uh, uh, just very briefly. I actually uh, spent the better part of a week in the Mandalay fish markets, right? Um, talking to uh, old fish sellers um, uh, and trying to figure out, you know, the naming of fishes and keeping all of the straight is an enormously difficult thing, even if you're working in English or French, right, let alone uh, Burmese, which and, and the names of all the fish were uh, unfamiliar to me. But it was clear to me that there was actually a lot of the fish sold in the Mandalay market are fish that come from uh, um, the Delta uh, and not from the, the river, the river itself. So I think it's true that there is not a sort of huge um, fishing industry, at least as I as I experienced it. Uh, I I think that um, well, the question is whether the Mietzon Dam is if 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 you want to make an argument in favor of hydroelectric power, uh, and it's a plausible argument if you're concentrating on Homo sapiens, as I mentioned earlier, um, then. Uh, it behooves us, um, if I stand in your shoes for the time being, to figure out how one can generate um, in a cost-effective way as much hydroelectric power as possible uh, with as little damage to the natural hydrology uh, of a river and the life forms in the river. And the Mietzon Dam, I think, was not uh, an optimal solution to that problem. Go ahead, Jamie. Okay. Well, Professor Scott, thank you for your wonderful talk. I, I, this is probably a, a, a big question, but I'll just put it out there. Um, looking at the uh, rivers prior to our ability to dam up rivers or reroute rivers, or humankind's ability to kind of alter the effect, do you see that human settlement along the Irrawaddy responded to these, these transition uh, between this kind of aquatic terrestrial transition zone that you I talked about, do you see historically, would we look for the footprint of, of kind of human settlement in cycles? Did they understand the cycles and the changes? I, I'm thinking about the Red River, but I was wondering about the, how in the Irrawaddy, if you saw any evidence of that. So when we actually look for evidence of, of human settlement, we should look in this kind of patterns of, of, the, of river usage or the, the river itself, as opposed to. It's a good. It's a good point. My under my understanding is that, like for many other rivers, um, that um, if you're looking for early human settlements, um, you're looking at, uh, and that's true for many of the delta towns. By the way, uh, they happen to be on little bluffs, right, that are above the uh, above the floodplain and relatively safe from. Uh, the annual floods and storms uh, and so on. Um, so, uh, and, and I think that's true for the upper Irrawaddy as well. I'm not 
as conversant with the archaeology of the early settlements along the Irrawaddy as I might be. Um, but that's that's my impression that you don't want to look at the, if you like, the 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 floodplain, the sort of rich uh, floodplain soils, but you want to look to nearby. And we're, we're talking about things like, you know, things that are 20, 30 meters uh, higher, or uh, no more often than um, the surrounding uh, the surrounding floodplain. Um, it's my guess. Great, and uh, Hans will have the last question before we um, stop the recording, and then just we'll uh, have an open few minutes together as well. Go ahead, Hans. Thanks. Hi, that was uh, extremely inspiring talk, and um, my question is about uh, complexity. I I found I'm in general I'm very sympathetic to this uh, opposition between the the kind of simplification. Um, and leaving the the river to to its complexity, and and that simplification in general had bad and negative consequences, and little uh, kind of prevention efforts created the possibility for much bigger floods. But I'm I'm wondering if this is always true, and whether not sometimes uh, we can also grant rivers the possibility to, to recreate new forms of complexity or to adapt to new situations. And one uh, reference I had that was, was kind of um, the Rhine and Heidegger, because, because actually the, uh, in this essay on technology, which he wrote in the 1950s, the Rhine plays a, a crucial role and specifically the opposition between the, the pre-rectified Rhine where poets such as Hölderlin look at the Rhine and there's an authentic kind of uh, feeling and, and, and engagement with the world. And, and then when he, in 1950, looks at the Rhine, the only thing he sees is uh, dams and hydroelectric dams. And he looks at one specifically and says, this is what modern technology does to the world. It makes the world inauthentic, unreal kind of. So, so it's like, like you said, you know, that's where, where you cut off all the four legs of the cat and it's not a river any longer. It's, it's something else. But, but Heidegger's assessment seems to be very black and white in the sense that modern technology totally destroys everything and there's, there's no more complexity and it's inauthentic. And, and, and my question is whether or not this is kind of taking it too far. Uh, the, the question is whether... Um... Heidegger's term inauthentic is the appropriate one to use. Um, I mean, depending on the perspective one might want to adopt, and there's several perspectives that are plausible. Um, uh, one might say that the river was relatively impoverished, right? Um, in the sense that it's Biodiversity was drastically reduced, right? Um, uh, the, if you like, the the wetlands that were, if you like, the nursery beds, right, of most of the life uh, along the Rhine were destroyed. Um, and and I think if if you want to then, like Heidegger, concentrate on the the human produced landscape of dams, right, uh, and levees and so on, then you get, if you like, the inauthentic uh, architectural interventions of uh, Homo sapiens. And so I, I see why he wants to call them inauthentic. I, I was impressed, um, this is something of a slight diversion, but I was impressed with the Japanese um, practice of, uh, which was abandoned at some point, but uh, an older practice of river management uh, in which um, Japanese river managers, engineers would um, hypothecate a kind of intervention in the river for human purposes. They were not interested in the wildlife in particular. Um, and, but they also understood that they did not understand the behavior of the river entirely. And so what they would do is to build a small weir where they would uh, imagine they would build a larger weir. 
and they would build it. And then they would, if you like, stand back for two or three years and see what the river did with it, right? How, the, how it changed the flow how everything changed right uh, around it, whether it accumulated silt, uh, what happened downriver and upriver from it uh, and so on. And then they would, in a sense, design their next intervention, which could be the removal of the weir for that matter. They would design their next intervention by what they had learned in the interim by not assuming that they understood the river completely at the beginning of the exercise. And I thought there's a kind of, I don't know, Taoist humility, if you like, to this way of understanding how to en engineer and landscape a river that sounds to me rather more scientifically defensible given the facts that the hydrology, I mean, the effort to understand the hydrology of the lower Irrawaddy um, scientifically uh, and the creation of islands in the Delta Right, uh, there are just too many variables um, to make it uh, 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 a scientific formula, uh, and all the more reason to observe carefully what happens at a particular instance, knowing that it's not going to be exactly replicated in the next instance. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Jim. Um, I think we should give Jim a little bit of a rest here um, uh, and join me in uh, thanking him for such a fantastic talk and wonderful conversation. Um, so pleasure. thank you, Jim. Thank you.